This is slide two in our uh, Industrial Revolution unit on railroad expansion. Um, there's one really big thing that allows the railroads to expand, and that is steel. Right? Something, in, something we're going to talk about uh, here in um, a couple of slides. A new development allows us to produce steel which is much better than iron. Uh, the railroad was known as the iron horse. The first ones were made out of iron. Uh, but then steel comes along, which is much better. Uh, and we are able to produce steel in very large quantities at very cheap prices. So the railroads grow because there's so much steel. And the steel industry grows because the railroad industry is buying their steel. So these two go hand in hand. Neither one could have succeeded the way it did without the other. Okay? But thanks to the impact of steel, uh, the railroads become the nation's leading industry. Uh, they employ more people than any other industry in the country. Um, there's more money invested in railroads than any other industry in the country. So um, uh, the railroads are... Are, are driving the economy of this country. Right? Now, thanks to new... Um, the, the railroads also grow because of improvements in them. Uh, new technology is developed. Uh, old ways of doing things are improved. New ways of doing things. So let's talk about five different improvements in the railroads. Okay? Five different ones. Um, and all these are very important. Um, probably the most important, at least in terms of safety, definitely the most important, was the invention of the compressed air brake. Okay, or just an, an air brake, as it's called. Okay. The, uh, the air brake, the compressed air brake, was invented by a man named George Westinghouse. Uh, just like it sounds. West, W-E-S-T, Ing, I-N-G, House, H-O-U-S-E, George Westinghouse. Here you see the historical marker from the state of New York, birthplace of George Westinghouse, inventor of the Westinghouse air brake, and so forth. Uh, and this is a diagram of what uh, the air brake looked like. Right? Now, um, again, as I told you in the first slide, it can be a lot, a lot, a lot of names in this unit. So every time I give you a name, and especially if I spell it for you, or it's already on here, pay note to it. You're going you're gonna to need to know it, okay? Anyway, the air brake. To understand why the air brake is such a big deal, you got to understand how brakes work before. Uh, really, it was each car of a train. Let's say you've got a train 50 cars long. Um, each car had its own brakes and its own brakemen, right? Um, and if you had to stop a train... It was a long, slow process. Okay? Um, you hoped brakemen in the cars realized the train was trying to stop and they applied their brakes okay? so that all the brakes were applied at once. That's the ideal. Usually what happens is you get the front of the train trying to slow down the back of the train, which is barreling on full speed because people in the back didn't see the signal. They didn't apply their brakes. So... Um, stopping a train was a very unsafe, very difficult process until George Westinghouse comes along. And he invents this contraption right here. Uh, this, the, what he comes up with uh, is the same basic concept we still use today. When a tarp pulls up beside you or a semi or something like that, and you hear that pshh from their brakes, it's the same basic concept that Westinghouse uh, comes up with. Right? In, the, in the late 1800s. So um, here's how it works in, the, the, in a very, very, very simplified process. Okay? Um, the, uh, this machine here that you see is in the engine of the train. It has one handle. Okay? Compressed air is built up from steam. Okay? Every car has brakes, and there is a long tube under the train that connects to each car, the brakes of each car. And when the engineer turns this handle at the top of the machine, 
compressed air is shot through the tube, the length of the train, and it applies the brakes on each car at the same time. So you turn one handle, all the brakes work at the same time, kind of simultaneously. Um, it's a much safer way to stop the train. So if you can stop the train much safer and much faster, your trains can travel faster. And if it means they can travel faster, they can get their goods to market much quicker. You can also have longer trains, whereas before you may have had, you know, a train uh, only 20 cars long. Now you can have a train 50, 60, 70, 80 cars long because you can stop it much safer. All right. So the compressed air brake, this is a huge deal. Okay, that's number one. Uh, the rest of them won't be that long, I promise. All right. Um, number two. Okay. These uh, two different types of cars, okay, train cars, they are both invented by a man named George Pullman, P-U-L-L-M-A-N, just like it sounds, Pullman, George Pullman. Okay. Um, Pullman invents, uh, basically makes cross-country train travel possible. If we now have a transcontinental railroad and people want to go from one side of the country to the other, uh, you got to have a couple of things happen before uh, you can travel across the country. One, you're going to need to be able to, to eat, and two, you're going to need to be able to sleep. Right? So Pullman invents, first of all, the dining car. Right? He had a, a car of a kitchen, basically with that, where they cooked the food, and another car or two, depending on how long the train was, for diners to set and eat. You could eat meals along the way. You didn't have to wait till the train stopped, get out, go into a little town, find a little diner and eat. You ate while the train traveled. Right? Pullman also invented a sleeping car. Now this one is it's fascinating. Um, I'll show you the pictures here. The very bottom of the page, okay? This is what a, a luxury Pullman car looked like, a Pullman sleeper car. Okay. You get nice little velvet benches here. Uh, people with money traveled in Pullman cars here. Okay. You got nice little velvet benches. You have these uh, little tapestries hanging on the wall here or paintings. Okay. And during the day, that's how you traveled. You sat up in your nice little comfy bench seat there, padded, cushiony seat. Um, you read, you did, you talked, you did whatever. But when nighttime came, these right here, if you look at the bottom of the picture here, or the bottom of the slide, this picture, these would fold down, and you got this right above it here, okay? This would fold down, and your bed would be in there. So a porter would come along with a little step stool, and you'd climb up the step stool into your bed, okay? And you get a nice little comfy, cushy mattress there with fluffy pillows, and you slept the night away while the train just kept rolling. Okay? And in the morning, you climbed down, you folded this back up, and you sat in your comfy little seat. It was a Pullman sleeping car. Ingenious. You use one car, but for two separate purposes. Daytime travel at the bottom, nighttime travel up here. Okay? Um, so now you can travel across country. You can eat, you can sleep. Okay? Uh, so that's two and three. Two different kinds of uh, cars there. A sleeping car and a dining car. Okay? Um, number four. Something called standard gauge, G-A-U-G-E, -E, standard gauge. And the gauge of a railroad track is the distance between the two rails. So if you look at the picture up there, how far apart these two rails are, or those two rails right there. That's the gauge of a railroad track, the distance between those rails. Okay? The problem was each railroad company laid their own railroad tracks. And every company built their cars and laid their track at a different gauge than another company, okay? One company's gauge may be, you know, um, I don't know, six feet wide. Another one may be five and three quarters feet wide. Another one may be six and a half feet wide, whatever. But the problem was then, nobody else's cars worked on anybody else's tracks. So you could only run your train cars on your tracks, which meant trains had to constantly stop and you had to get off and get on to a new one. Okay? Now let me give you an example of this. Okay? Um, 
you don't have to know these numbers or anything like that, but it's it's very telling. Okay, in 1860, okay, right before the Civil War begins, 1860, um, if you were going to go from New York to Chicago on a train, and that's about as far west as the trains went by 1860, uh, New York to Chicago, okay, it took you two days to get there, and you had to change rails. 17 times, 17 times, and it took you two days to get there. By 1870, just 10 years later, that's it, in 10 years, thanks to standard gauge, you could make the same trip in less than 24 hours and never have to get off of the train. So eventually the federal government says, this is ridiculous, okay? Uh, everybody's going to build their, their, their tracks and their train cars at the same width, and they set a standard gauge, okay? Uh, so that's number four. Number five, this seems simple, but you can't do it until you have enough steel to be able to do it, uh, is two sets of tracks. When railroads were initially built, it was only built with one set of tracks because you, you can't, you don't, we didn't have steel, and iron took too long to make. It was too expensive. But now that we have all this steel, you can have two sets of tracks. And what's the advantage there? You can have trains coming and going at the same time, passing one another. Before, if you had a train coming and going at the same time, they ran into each other, and you had a huge mess. Um, so all these improvements allow the railroads to expand very greatly. Um, one thing I forgot to tell you here, and you don't have to know the numbers, but again, it's very telling, okay? Uh, we talked about how important steel was. Uh, in 1873, okay, steel cost $100 a ton, and it doesn't take long to get, you know, a ton of steel. Um, by the late 1890s, it was $12 a ton. So steel is much more plentiful, uh, and you can build much more uh, with it. All right, moving on. The rest of this slide will go a lot quicker, I promise you. The big name you need to know in railroad, uh, and there's going to be one big name in each industry, the big name in railroads is Cornelius Vanderbilt. Right? Uh, Vanderbilt made a fortune in railroads, but that's not where he started. He actually uh, started by buying shipping companies, uh, and he shipped goods up and down the East Coast. That is, until the Civil War got going, uh, and all the ports along the East Coast were blockaded. So when Vanderbilt can no longer make money in shipping, he starts buying up railroads. Uh, and a little aside here, this is who Vanderbilt University is named after and why they are called the Vanderbilt Commodores. Uh, a Commodore was a naval officer. So since, since Vanderbilt's first fortune was in shipping, um, they named the, uh, the, the, the school there, the mascot, uh, after him, his shipping uh, background, uh, the Commodore. So anyway, Vanderbilt will uh, get out of shipping and start buying railroads. He will consolidate all of the railroads. Right? Uh, by the time Vanderbilt uh, dies, his fortune was estimated at $100 million. That's in 1877 money. Right? Um, if you will remind me in class, I have a fun little story to tell you about uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt. Okay? Uh, railroads also allow immigration. Uh, to really uh, fill the West. Uh, immigrants rode trains to the West, but they didn't quite travel in uh, the, the comfort and the luxury that people did uh, in Pullman cars. Uh, look at the bottom right-hand picture here in the, uh, uh, on, on the slide. This is an immigrant car. Notice it's very different from the one next to it. You get wooden benches to sit on. This is also a sleeper car. So same concept, the top, this side here on the left, you can see is folded down. But uh, you don't get, you know, a nice cushy mattress with fluffy pillows. You get a wooden plank to lay on. So if you wanted to pay for a bed, you got a wooden plank. If not, you could sit up in these wooden benches all night long. But uh, the railroads will, will take immigrants uh, to the west. Okay. We also have the railroads to thank for time zones. It was called Railroad Standard Time. And the fact that we have um, four time zones here in the continental or contiguous U.S., uh, Eastern, Central, Mountain, and Pacific, uh, we have the railroads to thank for that. 
Because before railroads, you know, the stagecoach came and went, and it was not really a big deal. The stagecoach was going to arrive sometime in the afternoon. Um, railroads, we need more exact timing. It's very important to know when trains are coming and going so they don't meet each other on the same track. So the government sets up time zones, okay? Uh, working our way backwards, one hour behind. At Eastern, it's, uh, let's say it's noon in Eastern. That means it's 11 a.m. here in Central, 10 a.m. in Mountain, and 9 a.m. on Pacific, okay? Because that's the direction the sun's going, all right? Okay, uh, last couple of things here. Railroad pools, right? Companies would compete with each other for your business, but what they noticed is that in order to compete, they had to lower prices, and they were losing money. While that's good for consumers, it's bad for the owners. So the owners got together and decided, you know, we're, we're losing money undercutting each other here. So instead of everybody cutting their prices lower and lower and lower and us losing money, how about we do this? The companies would take an area, and they would divide the area and say, okay, I'll take the business in this region, you take the business in that region, and I'll take the business in this third region. And then we can all charge what we want, and we're not competing for each other's business. So it's sort of an, um, I don't want to say this, an agreement to divide an area up and share the profits instead of losing profits. Federal restraint, we talked about in our last unit of the fact that uh, the farmers were getting screwed over by the railroads, railroads charging whatever they wanted to, um, and the uh, it's the federal government that ultimately has to step in, because thanks to a Supreme Court case, it was ruled that states had no power to regulate interstate commerce. So in other words, if business crosses state lines, let's say you own a company in Kentucky and you want to sell something to somebody in Indiana, you've now crossed state lines. If your business crosses state lines, the state governments of Kentucky and Indiana cannot interfere in that. Only the federal government can. Now, surely railroads cross state lines, so if anybody's going to rein the railroads in, it's going to have to be the federal government, and they do. They create what's called the ICC, the Interstate Commerce Commission. The Interstate Commerce Commission. Okay? And the Interstate Commerce Commission is going to be responsible for uh, enforcing laws that the federal government passes. For instance, federal government says pools are illegal. You can't divide up the area and keep prices high. You have to compete with each other everywhere. Okay? We're getting into monopoly stuff here, but that's okay. Um... They also said railroads had to publish their rates openly. So you knew how much it was going to cost on this railroad to go from New York to Chicago. So you could then compare prices among all the different railroad companies to see how much each of them charged. Okay? Um, lots of other ones. But the Interstate Commerce Commission is set up to basically rein in the railroads. Um, it is still around today, still doing much of the same things. All right. One more railroad slide coming up.